Hi, this is Kara from the Special Needs Mom podcast. And this is Angela from Especially Organized, Sensible Solutions for Special Needs Moms. We have this heart for special needs moms. And so we thought, you know what, let's combine forces. And we have come up with what we're calling the purge party. And you can pretty much guess what it is. It's a party where we're going to come together and we're going to purge or in general, accomplish a goal, a small goal together. So we have set this for January 27th, starting at eight o'clock for my Pacific Coast people. Which means 11 o'clock for all of you on the East Coast. So this is an opportunity. If you have something on your to-do list that has just been stuck there and you are wanting to move it up on the list, you're wanting to tackle, maybe it's a space or an area of your home or a category in your home that has just needed a little time and attention. This is your opportunity for you to be online with us while you work and have access for us to help you answer your questions, help guide you and just serve you for those two hours. Yeah, exactly. And I think you can tell like what we've designed is just this very high level of support for that project that you just haven't been able to tackle on your own. The thing that we are envisioning is that you get to leave this purge party feeling so accomplished because you did the thing, you started the year off getting that thing done that you you were stuck on last year. And so it's a momentum builder, if you will. You can go ahead and sign up. We have a link ready for you. And we are offering this for $40 for the whole experience. Absolutely. And we hope you'll join us. I think it's going to be really fun. It's going to be a great group of moms of special needs kids. So we all get each other. We all have an understanding of what it's like to have something on our to-do list, but just we haven't been able to tackle it yet. So I hope that you will join us. We're super excited to bring this to you and we are thrilled to work with you. All right. We'll see you all there. Hi, I'm Kara, life coach, wife, and mom to four incredible and unique children. It wasn't all that long ago that my son received a diagnosis that had my world come crashing down. I lacked the ability to see past the circumstances, which felt impossible, and the dreams I once had for my life and family felt destroyed. Fast forward past many years of surviving and not at all thriving, and you'll see a mom who trusts that she can handle anything that comes her way and has access to the power and confidence that once felt so lacking. I created the Special Needs Mom podcast to create connection and community with moms who find themselves feeling trapped and with no one who really understands. My intention is to spark the flare of possibility in your own life and rekindle your ability to dream. This isn't a podcast about your special needs child. This is a podcast about you. If you are a mom who feels anxious, alone, or stuck, then you are in the right place. Welcome. Hello, and welcome back to the Special Needs Mom podcast. I just got done recording the interview style episode with Dana Johnson. And I'm so grateful that one, she is a patient person because it literally took us months to schedule due to me having to reschedule many times. So Thank you for your persistence and your patience, Dana. And she is a mom of, wait for it, five kids and a full-time homeschooler. Now, I know other people that have five kids in homeschool, but every time I hear it, I just think that is surely something. What you're going to get to hear is a conversation between two moms that are figuring it out. And Dana is going to share her experience of having twins born at 30 weeks and having twin to twin transfusion syndrome and the things that she was expecting out of that condition and the things that she wasn't expecting. And towards the end of the episode, you're going to get to hear her lovely twins come into the room. (laughs) And so there's a little bit of noise and I know as moms, actually, um, maybe we'll feel more at home when we hear some of the noises in the background as we listen to this episode. And as you listen, what I want you to pay attention to is, especially towards the end, when we're talking about some of the things that come up for us when we hear 
the words, oh, you're so strong. And why that might kind of bother you or make you twinge a little bit. We also talk about the experience of processing the discomfort that we have in parenting children with disabilities. And this is something I'm actually kind of learning a lot more about is even just the language around how we talk about our kids and how adults with disabilities want to be talked about. And so I think this is a space where my intention is that we can kind of talk about these things wherever we are at in the journey. There's no right or wrong way here in this podcast. And so let's get into this episode. I know you will enjoy our time with Dana. Well, Dana, welcome to the show. I want to honor you as probably the most patient guest so far. (laughs) Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, what I'm referring to is that Dana and I have been talking for months. Uh, I think I had to reschedule you like three or four times. However, I'm not holding it against myself because we were having a pretty intense season. And I'm glad that we're here today. So why don't we start with you telling us a little bit about day in the life of your life as it is now, and then in a little bit, we can kind of look back at to how you got to where you're at now. So tell us a little bit about a day in the life of Dana. Well, I am trying to wake up before my kids. My toddlers are, I have twin toddlers. They just turned three and they are escape artists. We decided because there's two of them to leave them in their baby beds as long as we possibly can. One of them, however, can climb out. So he's just where waking up his siblings. So I try to get up fairly early so I can intercept him. How Um, early is that for you? Because these toddlers, some of them wake up pretty early. Now, as it gets closer to summer, uh, it's the sun. We have blackout curtains and somehow the sun still wakes him up. So I'm up at 530 so that I can intercept him before he wakes up the whole yeah. My kids are homeschooled, so we don't really have like a firm schedule. They wake up when they wake up, which is usually around seven. We eat breakfast, we do our schoolwork. My parents live close by and my mom is my, my bestie. So uh, we see them a lot and we kind of just work schoolwork around grandparent time and doing fun stuff. And my non-escaping three-year-old, he is my special needs kiddo and he has therapy once a week. So Thursdays, we just kind of wing it because he's got therapy in the morning. And then sometimes he's super exhausted um, and not easy to get along with for the rest of the day. So (laughs) have some laid back time and we just kind of hang, we're together all of the time and didn't see my life going in that direction when we first started having kids, but I love it. And I'm glad that they are with me almost all the time. What did you imagine it to be like when you first started having kids? I was, um, very young when we had our first child and I was still in college and I was like, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to be a career woman. I'm going to, I wanted to go into Mm. enforcement and we had her in, in uh, preschool and then public uh, pre-K and it just wasn't for us. It wasn't a good fit for her. I changed my mind career-wise about what I wanted to do and took some time off of college, uh, started working in a restaurant. So then my schedule was flexible. I could work at night when my husband was home and I would be home all day. So when she was just little, I was like, well, homeschool them right now. When they get older, we'll reassess if that's not what's best for them. And then we just really love homeschooling. So that's what we're going to do. I feel like most people I talk to, they kind of fall into homeschooling. They never really intended on being a homeschooler. One of my close friends here locally, it's funny because she's the opposite person that I would ever imagine to homeschool. Just, it's just never something I would picture her doing, but it's, and she has like a, a dual kind of program where it's a little bit in school a little bit, homeschool. And so she fell into it. So how old are all your kids? So you have three-year-old twins. Tell us about the rest. I have a seven-year-old boy, an almost 11-year-old boy, 
And our daughter, our one and only girl, is going to be 14 in July. The twin thing really throws you off because you're like, wait, there's three. Oh, there's actually five. <laughs> when you add that extra. Even number. We'll have, go for four. Oh. Even perfect. And then twins. And I was like, that's it. We're done. We're not getting our even number. Forget it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That must have been a surprise. What was it like when you found out you were having twins for you? So I have never had a feeling of having twins. Never was like, oh, maybe with the first three. I had so many dreams in between finding out we were expecting again to finding out they they were twins. And I'd never had that happen. So I was surprised. But at the same time, I was like, have these dreams for a reason, obviously. So finding out we were having two more boys was probably more. (laughs) Yeah, I could see how that would go. Um, Another one of my very close friends here locally, she's like been my best friend since freshman year in high school. She has, wait for it, seven boys and one girl. So that's a lot of boys. That's a lot lot of boys. They're the best boys though. Okay. Um, very random question, but because you mentioned this dream thing, have you, do you have other dreams that when you look back at them, you see that they had interest or intrigue or maybe some meaning? Yes. And very specifically, they've all been about children. I will have a dream that a friend is expecting and then it'll be like a few weeks later that they announce that they're expecting and this has happened to me several times I typically have very strong feelings about not only the gender of my babies but other people's babies it's so interesting so the reason I asked that question is I find that I have a lot of very interesting dreams very like I can remember them very well. And just like I look back at them, I'm like, there has to be some meaning to that. Like one of the dreams I had uh, when Levi was in the hospital recently here was that it was my brother who was climbing up a ladder and falling off. Right. Like that's a very random dream. And so like, you you know, then of course I'm Googling. What does it mean when someone falls off a ladder in a dream? And um, it's something along the lines of like, you feel like it was very spot on. It was like, you feel like you're losing control of someone you love very deeply or something like that. I was like, well, that pretty much covers it. And anyhow, so I just think it's interesting to kind of pay attention. Some people are like, I don't remember any dreams at all, but I think it's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. (laughs) So you mentioned your three-year-old is your child that is different than the others. And so tell us a little bit about becoming a parent of a child that requires a little bit more? So pretty early on in my pregnancy with them, um, we knew that pregnancy-wise there was going to be some complications because they're identical twins and they share they shared uh, a placenta. There was, um, they did have two separate amniotic sacs. So they weren't like the super complicated type of twins. Um, but when they share a placenta, they don't always share equally and it's called twin to twin transfusion syndrome where one twin is what they call the donor twin. One's the recipient twin and the donor twin kind of like gives up all of the nutrients and blood supply and all that to the other twin. Even that name is hard to process. The the language there is hard to like take as a mom hearing that. I don't know. How did that? I was like, that is hard to hear. I was like, oh, so I'm going to just spend every day on Google for the next. However, (laughs) I managed to stay Uh. pregnant. And so right from that was at we got sent kind of in an emergency sent to the children's hospital in Pennsylvania, uh, in Philadelphia, which is like, I can't remember how long it took us, like 10 hours for, our, I was going to say like how far that's, that's far. 10 hours it's, is very far. Especially when you have three other kids to like figure out. And that was at 16 weeks. Wow. So 
my whole pregnancy, basically, we were like, okay, what's this going to look like? The good thing about twin to twin transfusion syndrome is once the babies are born, unless there are other complications being born early or stuff like that, the issues from it are, are gone. So my whole pregnancy, we were worried about the donor twin. And we were setting ourselves up for, okay, they're going to have to be born early. And then there's the complications that come with being preemies, needing oxygen, feeding tubes, all of that. Our baby A, that our recipient twin, he was a whole pound bigger, which they were two and three pounds. So like, that's a lot. Mm, yeah, <laughs> different. a whole lot. <laughs> um, we were not worried about twin A ever. We were like, he had some, he had excess fluid. And twin B didn't have hardly any. In fact, the morning they were born, there was none mm. in his chaotic uh, sack. So we're not worried about twin A at all. We're like, oh, as soon as he's born, like he'll be fine. He is our special kiddo. So it was a shock because we had spent weeks and weeks thinking, okay, yeah. our baby B, he's going to be, he's going to need some help. And he did come home on oxygen, but that was for like, a month. And then he was like, forget this. I'm a tough little guy. <laughs> and he's our escapee baby. No, oh, I see this. And so then all of a sudden we're just thrown into this. Oh, brain ultrasounds aren't coming back normal. Mm -hmm. They're just discharged. We're going to have to do an MRI. Oh, you're going to have to meet with the neurologist who we adore. Like, thank goodness. This is the specialist we got stuck with because she was our favorite. <laughs> in the NICU. So we knew that there was going to be some ongoing stuff after they were born, but we were shocked which baby it turned out to be. Yeah. It's weird how it's like you thought you were kind of maybe mentally, emotionally, spiritually prepared because you were expecting something to not kind of just be completely seamless. Right. But it was like, you, you obviously like you, it still was like so unexpected it's really interesting yeah it it was a lot because yeah I had just spent all this like emotional energy preparing for mm. one of them we knew he was going to be the smaller twin we knew he was probably going to struggle more to to breathe and and all of those things. And it was going to take him longer to catch up. And size wise, it did. He's, they're still tiny, but of course they were born at 30 weeks. So the potential for other things to go wrong was always there, but I do feel like it kind of got downplayed to us about mm. the risks for the other twin. Yeah. Looking back at that conversation, right? That like the doctors were preparing you for something and you're having obviously multiple doc doctor conversations. What would you kind of tell yourself now, knowing what you do now, that maybe is the support you would have wanted during that time? Um. The reminder that our babies are not the only, we're not the only babies that the neonatologists were seeing. I felt like they were very cold hmm. and they were just kind of, they'd tell us things very like matter of factly and not, not with a lot of compassion. They'd just be like, your baby's brain ultrasound showed issues. Okay. We're going around in the next room. And <laughs> I can't and see how that, oh my goodness, you jerks. But then yeah. I'm like, they have a whole NICU of babies that they have to look after and a whole, they can't get emotional with every single set of parents because they wouldn't be able to do that job very long. And to not take that personally, mm. I will say the nurses were different. We had one nurse that we really, really liked. She was the only one who like snuggled the babies. Like she'd take them out of their little isolette and snuggle them while she was like typing up their chart on the computer. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was getting ready to retire. So she'd been doing this a long time. 
And she was very grandmotherly and very maternal towards us. And so I assume all Mm -hmm. of the parents that she had. And so that was, that eased my mind a little bit, knowing that at least three days a week, she, you know, she was there because our NICU where they were born is uh, an hour and a half away from where we live. So I was, couldn't be there all the time every day because we still had three other kids at home and my husband had to work. So there were days that we didn't see the babies because life. And that's hard. But the nurses in particular always were like, call us as often as you need to. Even if nothing has changed, even if it's been 30 minutes and you just feel like you need to check on them again, call us as often as you need to. And that was really, really comforting. Um, I still felt like, oh, I'm annoying the nurses. (laughs) (laughs) But that's, you know, mom guilt. Yeah, I was actually going to ask a question about how you did manage having three young children at the time while you had this very intense other season. How long were the twins in the hospital? They were there for two months. They came home 10 days apart. So it was a lot, but thank goodness for my parents and my in-laws. They took our, our older kids, they drove them back and forth to their activities. We had two in karate at the time. And I was determined like their lives are not going to be affected by this. And looking back, I would have done things differently. I would have been like, we're not doing karate for the summer. Like it's too much. (laughs) And they would have understood, but I was just so determined to not let their lives Mm. get upheavaled by the babies. I didn't want them to, to resent that the babies took all of my time away from them. And they didn't, they were totally fine. We've never had like sibling jealousy issues. I can relate to that so much. I, I might be doing better than I used to. I'm not sure. Cause they think during this uh, you know, actually, and I'm realizing this has been a very long season. I was like, why did this school year feel so hard? Oh, yeah, it's because the whole time my son has been dealing with this, I'll call it a new diagnosis, even though it's a second of the same diagnosis. I think it's interesting as mothers how I think we just have this instinct to protect. Yeah. And so it's like, I think even though our children or other, the sibling children are not going through the same thing. I think we have that desire to protect them. And a lot of times I don't think we know how. And I think perhaps a mistake we make is that one, that we can control the emotional impact of the thing that's happening to our special needs child, the medical condition, or just the impact of their disability. And I think that it's one of our attempts to actually protect ourselves too in actually thinking that we can control the impact of it. I know that when I get a new diagnosis, I want to kind of protect people. I don't like to share it right away. Not like me personally getting a diagnosis, but when I'm processing a new diagnosis for my son. And I think it's an attempt to control those feelings. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I think that's true. So when they were, when the babies were in the NICU, there's two levels. So there's, there's the NICU and then there's continue, the continuing care nursery. Sometimes it's called the step down nursery. So our older kids never, they didn't meet the babies until they moved into the step down care and they didn't see pictures of them because although they knew that there was medical stuff going on. We didn't want them to be introduced to their new siblings with IVs in their belly buttons. And I, um, one of them had an IV in his head and breathing tubes and all that. It's scary. And we didn't want that to be the image that they had 
of their their new siblings. And I always was careful what I talked about in front of them, trying to protect them from information that they wouldn't necessarily understand, except to know that it's not normal. And in keeping with taking them to karate and doing, making sure that we were still doing fun stuff because it was the summer, even though I really wasn't there. Yeah. Physically, I was there, but I'm like, okay, how are the babies doing today? Did they have any more spells? Was their breathing okay? Did they take all of their feedings? Why is one growing more than the other? Why is the feedings so much different? It was, if I would have, especially our older two, if I would have said, listen, this is what's going on with the babies. Here's the picture. These are what all of these different things that you can see on them mean. And it's not normal, but the nurses there do this all day, every day. They're in good hands and they're going. And we never told them the babies were going to come home. We never had any reasons to think that they weren't but we didn't want to promise them that they were going to. And looking back though, I think that I should have had a lot more faith in my older kids because Mm. kids are so much, I don't know what the right word is, better than we give them credit for. They deal with things so much better than we give them credit for. And I wouldn't say that I regret what I did because I did what I thought was right at the time and it worked out fine. But yeah, I would, I wish I would have been more confident in how we had raised particularly our older two up to that point that they would be able to handle what they needed to handle. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I think that it's just wonderful to be with another mom that's also experiencing the we don't know what the heck we're doing, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in these situations that are unimaginable, unthinkable, right? That you'd never imagine that one day your babies would be an hour and a half away from you, dependent on machines and people to sustain them while you're parenting your three other young children. I love that you're bringing reflection. And I love that I see you bringing compassion for yourself because you're like, I was literally doing the best you could. And I think also, yeah, I think we can all relate to the being there physically, but, but not present. And I think it's a constant struggle for probably most moms. And I think especially challenging when our, our, our minds, um, as the parents of our children are constantly thinking about you know, the appointments, therapies, the how do we support our children with the challenges that they have. Since we're talking a little bit about the sibling experience, I'd love to hear because many moms of young kids have a natural tendency to compare their children with other kids at their same age. It's kind of what we do, right? Like, oh, that kid's walking, my kid's walking. It's kind of, I think, a natural process. And so since you have two identical children, I can imagine it's even more obvious that how they're acting in this world is not identical. So how do you cope with that as a mom watching your children? And I'd love to hear also how you kind of, as a family, talk about that and support that. Um. So I mentioned that we love the neurologist that we see. She encourages when there's multiples that siblings, especially as babies, when they're hitting all those so many milestones so fast, um, she encourages siblings to come to the appointments. Well, not for the last two years, but prior to that. Okay. (laughs) um, And she was like, you know, what they say in textbooks, whatever. She's like, that's a handful of kids in the grand scheme of things. She's like comparing multiples to each other is going to be much more accurate. They've gone through the same things. Hmm. So I was like, okay, someone has given me like permission to compare them for the sake of making sure they are meeting milestones in a certain way. We've 
kind of gotten past that where they are three and they've gotten past all of those like major physical milestones. But because they were 10 weeks early, they both were delayed. So it was good to have a typical twin to compare our special needs kiddo to because I'm like, okay, he's on the same timeline. So I can compare Wally. He's our he's my special needs kiddo to Henry, you know, that's an accurate comparison as opposed to a child born at full term or any other child born at 10 weeks who didn't have all of these other circumstances. And here comes, hi, here comes (laughs) my escapee baby. (laughs) This is so great. I asked her before the episode, I was like, so where are all these children right now? Because we're recording my time 11, her time, what would that would be like two? Yeah. And uh, she's like, well, the twins are napping. Her three elders are camping, which sounds so fun. So uh, <laughs> this is hilarious. So we have the escape artist who is apparently not tired anymore. Hi. Well, hello. His little curly hair or at least wavy. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, who's that strange lady with that weird microphone? Um, so we, as far as like comparison to our other kids, we're like, yeah, forget it. Doesn't matter what they did at what age, because just being preemies was going to change when yeah, they. That makes so much sense, actually. I love that your doctor. I love people who throw out textbook and like throw out rules, by the way. It's my people. But uh, I love that she kind of gave you almost like a tool to like here this is how we can think about it like let's use one of these guys as like hey this is like maybe what's typical for these boys and like the benchmark for them it's really interesting and it's been uh when they were little it was helpful because i'd like think back or like pictures would come up on like facebook of like oh this is when the other ones were walking or sitting or whatever and i'm like forget that um, <laughs> see what these guys are doing and they, their physical milestones were way different than our other kids and super different from each other. This little escapee started walking six months before his twin did, which I always, the whole time I was like, I gotta, gotta look at the positives of our situation regardless of what the situation is. And I was like, I only have to chase one toddler. Yeah. I will ease into them going in two different directions. Perfect. And now they just both crazy everywhere. <laughs> I like that. I think something that we try to do is, is overly positivize things. That's not a word, but like overly make things positive. Yeah. In a way of actually not acknowledging the sad and the hard. But I think that sounds like it was a little bit different where you were actually just saying, okay, this is a gift right now in this moment. Like, yes, I want them to walk and I hope they'll walk one day. And I'm going to actually have gratitude that in this moment they're not walking because I can see how that serves me. So that's actually, I think, an effective tool for kind of looking at how to kind of have your life be in a positive lens through your eyes. Yeah, they were uh, born by C-section, emergency C-section. And I thought about that a lot too. Like I was discharged from the hospital and was able to come home and heal from having a C-section, which was terrible. And of course I would have rather had them home with me and skipped the emergency anything altogether, but I could heal and without having newborns home two of them constant and I think I was able to to recover faster than I would have been obviously if they were home and so then I could do what I needed to do to drive an hour and a half each way to be with them to still be with my older kids and trying to recover from a C-section with twins and other kids. Like I can't imagine that 
Um, but yeah, I, I had to look at it as what is, what is the positive thing about this that I can focus on right now? Because so much is hard. So much is a struggle. And I was like, I can, I can sleep for solid, like four hour stretches before I have to wake up to pump, to bring, you know, breast milk to the NICU the next day. If they were home, I would have, you know, been not sleeping at all because I'm nursing two babies. So I just, I had to focus on what is the good about this situation or the good moments, even if the whole situation isn't good. Thank you so much for sharing that. Cause I think early in my journey, I remember hearing about grat- being grateful. And I think I was coming up on, on Thanksgiving and I was kind of like, F gratitude. Like I am not thankful for this. And I think I was interpreting that I need to be grateful for the thing that I wasn't grateful for. Like, so we'll just say like in your case, like your twins in the NICU and the difference is, is we can allow that to truly be hard and sucky. We don't have to make that something that you're grateful for, but you found something else that you could genuinely have. Like you look back even, you're like, I don't know how I would have done it. Like you're genuinely thankful that you had this built in support so that you physically could help, uh, help yourself recover. And I think that that, so really kind of allowing both to exist, both your gratitude and both the really, really hard, because that's actually when I finally realized that I was like, Oh, I finally get it. And I could genuinely have gratitude, which I mean, I think we've all heard about all the wonderful things about gratitude. And when you really experience it, then you realize, Oh, I see like the magic in the power of gratitude. Yeah, absolutely. I think that my experience was different because I was able to, to genuinely have those, those positive feelings about little things. There were big things too, like being so thankful that we live somewhere that there is a NICU and that ultrasounds are a thing that were so detailed that they could, you know, could see the fluid levels and, you know, that I was able to have an emergency C-section because they wouldn't have made it if not. Mm. Then also at the same time, I didn't like, I didn't like the doctor that I saw saw for my care. (laughs) He was like, no, they can, they can make it. There's no reason they need to be born early. And then he was actually the doctor who had to make the decision to do the emergency C-section. And I was like, ha, I told you from the beginning, I don't feel like confident that they're going to make it to 38 weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So before we got on the, this recording, we had talked about, um, this thing we often hear as special needs moms and it's that saying you're so strong I couldn't do what you do yeah and I want to just hear your thoughts on that and so take it away let's hear what do you think about that so anytime there is a parent who has more kids or only has one kid. I hear, I see mom in with one child get this too, or they're have a special needs kid or whatever. Oh, I couldn't do what you do. You do it if you had to. We, and this of course applies to, to dads as well, but mothers would walk through fire if we had to, you just, you just do what you have to do for your kids. And I'll, I have still, even now I have a lot of friends who are like twins. I can't imagine it. Like, well, if you had twins, you'd do it. You, you do what I do. Cause what choice do you have? It just, it is what it is. And I was raised by a single mother. I have one brother and she did all the things all the time. And she is still that way as Mimi everywhere she needs to be all of the time. And I say it to her, I say it to her all the time too. I'm like, I don't know how you did it. And she says the same thing. She's like, I had to, what choice did I have? 
And I think, you know, that we downplay how strong we are as mothers. We don't, even if we believe it about ourselves, we don't necessarily like to admit it. I don't know why, but I don't think I'm, in, I'm stronger than any other mother. I think mothers will just do what they have to do. I agree. Definitely. Well, what's interesting as you're sharing, I'm thinking, I think, yeah, we, we do this thought process for a lot of things. I can't imagine having twins. I also like my, I can't imagine most things that I haven't been in the circumstance. And I think that's like the case for kind of anything in life, right? You can't imagine being a mom before you are one. But why do you think this bothers us, special needs moms? Like, why do you think it kind of gets under our skin a little bit when people say this to us specifically? Because if someone said, oh, I can't imagine having four kids, I'm like, eh, whatever. Like, yep, you get used to it. I don't feel the same energy around it. I think part of it, I think we can see how much our kids go through, Mm. uh, our special needs kiddos. And I think this to myself a lot, like, is it challenging? Yes. But imagine being a three-year-old who doesn't have the vocabulary yet to communicate how he's feeling but still has those feelings and then especially having a twin can see that his brother can do things he can't and and then then having people get his siblings and us because we're human get frustrated with him when he has throws a fit when I know it's just because he's not being naughty he just doesn't know how to Mm. communicate what's happening and doesn't necessarily understand what's going on and that I think part of that is why it's so like triggering for me because I'm like oh you think that I'm strong imagine what he's going through Mm. like I have a strong kid I have to be a strong mom I wonder if it also taps into like what what I'm noticing for myself is two things. Like one is like, it's so not fair, right? Like it's like, and I don't get stuck here and I don't ruminate here, but like, really, like if you look at some of the kids, things our kids have had to go through, like it's not fair. It's not fair that one person should have to go through multiple surgeries in my case and somebody else doesn't, right? This, like, I don't believe life is fair. So like it just, but it just sucks, right? It just is a hard yeah. thing to be with. Um especially when you're the parent of this child. The other thing that I was thinking about as you were sharing is that when people say that, I think we also think they actually have no idea how like you put, you touched on this, how strong we really are because the things that we have to do to parent our children are extraordinary, right? Like I just, I think of all the moms I've gotten to talk to the hospital stays, the bills, the emotional energy it takes to hold space for the whole family when we're working on like critical diagnoses. Like you did not know if your children were going to come home from the hospital, right? And so I think this is not necessarily fully seen by even people close to us. That I think sometimes maybe the the comment, oh, you're so strong, I don't know how you do it, is maybe even touched on and you have no idea yeah I agree and I think also when people say oh you're so strong then we kind of get this feeling like well shoot now I have to be now I can't Mm. get emotional about it or you know show up late to an appointment because I just don't have it together as much as people think that you do from the outside I think that's part of it too. And people might be able to see physically like appointments and if your kiddo has stays in the hospital and all of that, but the, you can't see the emotional side of it. And I, since having children, am a crier. And I'm like, and there are so many times when they were in the NICU And in the last three years that I am like, well, that's it. Today's going to be the day that I just cry for hours. And then a child wakes up and then five children are awake. And I'm like, (laughs) 
the day that I do that because I can't have an emotional breakdown in front of all of them. Uh, yeah, now I want to do a full episode on how to have our emotional breakdowns and parent our children at the same time. Um, and, and when I say breakdown, uh, I actually mean that in a positive light, like actually breaking down the barriers of like holding it all together. Because actually, so I've actually been, this is what I've been actively working on in my life. I'll give you guys a little behind the scenes. We are in the second week off of radiation. And so this is the time where I call it the least favorite time. It's the coming out of the intense season. It's when things start to feel even more chaotic because you no longer have the focus of like whatever the thing is that you're getting through. And you start to kind of uh, come back online in terms of feeling stuff. And so I experience a lot of like numbness and then finally I can engage in, in my emotion and, and feel it. And actually last Friday, I basically cried all day and it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. But I had the luxury of having all my kids at school. And by design, I had nothing else I needed to do that day. So I was not focusing on clients. I was not focusing on recording a podcast episode. And therefore, I am behind. <laughs> um, but I gave myself the space. And it's interesting that I had to give myself the entire week to be able to get to that place where I was able to finally break down, to like pull down the barrier that I think we're constantly fighting against as moms, like trying to keep it together so that we keep just the logistical stuff going for our kids. So anyhow, maybe more on that later, but what's your experience with that? Yeah. So my kids are home all the time and it's great. I love it. Like I wouldn't change that at all. But there are days, especially in the early days of the babies being home and trying to coordinate physical therapy and occupational therapy and all of these different things, um, having one on oxygen and trying to make sure that we had the, you know, the little sticker things that hold the, the tubes in their nose and that he wasn't pulling on those. And all of these things, I was like, oh, I could just cry for like 20 minutes be great the when we brought them each home coincidentally they both came home on days that my husband had to be couldn't leave work so I drove them home <laughs> how ideal <laughs> and thank goodness it is like 95 percent me driving on the highway to make that trip because I uh just cried almost the whole way. And then it felt good for a little bit. Now, you know, I, I can play with them now and crying is different emotional release, but being able to like run around and play with them or push them super high on the swings. I have found for me are, it's different than when I can just like cry and get it out of my system, but it's still this like, stress release and that's only been recent that I have like figured that out for myself and I used to honestly get kind of jealous of my husband he'd be stressed and he'd go I don't know build something and like pound nails into wood and mm -hmm. get it out and I'm like I'm gonna take it out on the mashed potatoes <laughs> Or eat my weight in chocolate. <laughs> so I think it's really important that moms find something. And I, I feel like we, we think we're being selfish. And it doesn't have to be this constant, like, every day. Or once a week, nobody can talk to mom for the whole day because mom's going to do whatever. But I think some kind of regularly when we're dealing with so much that there is some way for us to release the stress, the emotions, to cry all of the tears that we can't cry at doctor's appointments, at therapy, at whatever for our kids. I think that's, that's really, really important and I'm not good at it. 
for myself. But I, but I think moms need it, especially moms dealing with special needs kids, because it's just another, another layer. It's a complication that none of us ever saw coming. And so even if you can deal with the day-to-day, fine. That, that surprise of all of a sudden your world has completely changed for the rest of your life and the rest of your child's life is a lot. And we don't give ourselves enough credit for what we do. And that going back to the people making the comments about you're so strong, I think that's part of it too. It's uncomfortable to be told that you're strong, that, that you're doing a good mm. job. So I think for a lot of women, a lot of moms, that's an uncomfortable feeling because we don't feel like we are. That is a really interesting point that perhaps it has more energy, that comment, because we know how hard it is to parent these kids. And I think we also know, well, let me say that differently. I think we always are asking the question, am I doing enough? So when someone says you're so strong, I think it's really hard to take it in and to say, yeah, I am so strong. And it's interesting. I actually wrote a piece, um, a piece. I sound so fancy. I wrote some things on my computer <laughs> uh, on this cry day I had last Friday. And I'm, I'm thinking I might record an episode about it because it was actually, it was on this topic. So I'll leave it there now because I want to honor your time and uh, allow you to go sweep with your little sweetheart. <laughs> and Dana, I just thank you so much. I really enjoyed just hearing your experience, your story, your wisdom. And like, I think having your genuine experience of like, hey, I'm trying to figure out how to let this energy out and I'm experimenting with things and I'm finding things that are working and I don't know if I'm good at this yet. Uh, I think it's so good to hear because I think I relate to it and I know the parents of this community are definitely going to relate and feel like, wow, I'm not alone and I'm working on it too. So thank you so much. Is there anything you want to share in the final thoughts of this episode? Oh, just that I don't think I ever mentioned what is going on with my special Wally. And he calls himself my special baby. (laughs) That is so sweet. Different. And so we're just like, yeah, of course you are. And it's awesome. And you're you. Um, He has uh, cerebral palsy. Mm. Um, So if there's any other like moms that listen to this and have a kiddo going through that too. Yeah, that's what's going on with my little guy and um, possibly some other stuff too. But yeah, that's physical special needs are so interesting at this age. (laughs) I can relate. (laughs) What's in, yeah, so what's interesting is that the, so my son became disabled at age two, right? And so what's interesting about his, basically brain damages it was very what well, he would get services through the same community that service a lot of kids that had cerebral palsy and there's a lot of similarities right he's getting ott like the just the way that some of the kids with cp would would have their physical disabilities and so i feel like a kindred spirit to that community and yeah it's a real trip <laughs> when you're when we have able bodies i think it's so hard to understand what it's like to be in a body that has a disability. And so I think that's a constant struggle of mine and many parents. I think you can't always, can't always tell. So it's not like extreme and not that I want it to be either, but when you see a child in a wheelchair or walking with a walker or something like that, you can see you can, you can see it. He does wear braces and he has special sneakers. And now that he's like wearing shorts, you can see them, but I feel like he's getting to that age where other kids are just like at the playground, just look at him. Like, why can't you do the same things we can do? Yeah. I so feel you on this because 
both like this very similar with my son's physical disability. People, I think, can see him walk and he has a modified gait, but you can't always tell. You can't always tell. And, they, and even if they can't tell, they're like, they have no idea why. Like, why is that child walking differently? The other thing, like, so my son's visual impairment is also very, like, you can't tell. You cannot tell that he's blind in one eye. So when he walks by people and either hits them or just walks in front of people, it's so uncomfortable for me as a parent to just allow it to be and to not make excuses or to try to say, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, he didn't right. see you or whatever. Like, I am I had to deal with my own discomfort of just letting them maybe be upset Um because it didn't sound, I didn't like what it was like to like constantly be kind of defending for him when I was like, there's nothing to defend for. He's a human that just accidentally walked in front of this person. And so I don't know, it's a real, it's, I'm constantly growing in this area too. Me too. And the, because they don't go to school or daycare, the playground is where it all happens. Um, <laughs> yeah. And there are so many times now that now that he has um his braces come up a little bit higher and you can see them i'm like oh parents are going to notice you know Mm. parents will see them even if kids are not paying other three-year-olds are not paying attention but like last summer he was still new to walking and especially with braces and all that and he was very clumsy on top of the muscle weakness that he has and so at the playground I could see like other kids would look at him and so I might not say something to him directly but I'd like loudly say something about his braces and then I was like why am I doing that he's just a little boy trying to play on the playground like he doesn't need to constantly hear people like talking about him like that so trying to trying to not do that. Yeah, I think good catch, by the way, on yourself. And I think talking about it like this, I think is so good, because I'm actually reading a book on uh, this kind of focus on ableism. It's called Demystifying Disability. And it really kind of we recognize that all of us were raised with ableist thoughts, like ableist thinking and all these things like, and I, we just don't realize it. And so catching ourselves thinking that you have to kind of explain to people why he might be different and realizing, Oh, I don't think this like actually helps him. (laughs) This is recognizing my discomfort with him being different. And again, like it's allowing that discomfort of ours so that we don't go and say stuff that is not going to make our children feel awesome, most likely. Right. And our first responsibility is to them, not to strangers who look at them weird at the playground. I do notice my my older kids will say stuff to other kids. If other kids are, you know, kids from the call, like, why does he wear braces? And they'll tell them. And I'm like, that's what they feel comfortable doing. And that's fine. I think coming from sibling is different than you're coming from a parent. Well, I think it's, I'll enter. Yeah. I'll interject too. I think it's also different explaining, answering a question versus like kind of what I'm talking about for myself is kind of like trying to prevent people from thinking negatively about my son by like saying something, right. That's a very different experience. So I think that's just a little bit different. Um, Were you going to say something else? Just, yeah, I completely agree. Answering a question, especially a child's question is definitely (laughs) here comes another one. Um, (laughs) She's got two. (laughs) Than, than just um, like preemptively, well, and assuming that someone is going to be negative about it. Like we had a kid yes. who was, I don't know, maybe five, noticed his braces. And I was like, oh, he's going to say something. He was just like, I like those and kept on playing. And I was like, why was my first thought that he was going to be not nice? That's really interesting. I think it also will depend on on how your son feels about talking about his disabilities. 
My son loves talking to people about all the things. Like he loves sharing his stories. He loves when people ask him about it. And so I think that actually for me, like I like that because it, hi, I have, we have another little visitor on the recording. Uh, it just makes it, I feel like easier for me because I don't have to uh, kind of check with him on when I want to talk about something, I know what he wants. And I obviously always still check, yeah. but it, it just, I guess, makes it a little bit like I don't have to worry about that part of it. Yes. I am interested to see what this one thinks about himself. He has in the last few months, like I had mentioned earlier, knows that he's different and he'll say that with pride. He's like, I'm different. I'm your special boy. And I'm like, you are my special boy. <laughs> Well, likely he's going to be very informed by his siblings and his parents and how they think about him. So I think he's off to a really good start that doesn't necessarily make life easier. (laughs) So Dana, thank you so much again for this conversation. Obviously, I think we have a lot of things to talk about as special needs moms. And so I thank you for your time and your story. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. We'll see you all in the next episode. One more thing before we officially, officially wrap up this show. Sometimes when I'm listening to podcasts, I have the experience of wanting more. I'm listening at the very end thinking, I sure wish that episode didn't end. I invite you, if you feel in any way the same way, I invite you to the Special Needs Mom podcast community, which is a free group that I host on Facebook, where we as a community of fellow moms who listen to this podcast and are experiencing life in similar shoes, get to talk to one another, get to share stories, get to actually interact. I hope you'll consider joining. See you over there.